Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm just going to load my PowerPoint here and uh, we'll get started. So my name is Matthew Lilly. I am one of the orthopedic sports medicine surgeons here at the center, and I specialize in treatment of uh, surgical conditions of the knee and shoulder, and uh, want to go through common causes of shoulder pain and treatment options and uh, what we can do about it. Uh, so I've been practicing here in Central Oregon uh, for uh, the past five years and uh, in the end local uh, originally, and I've had the um, great opportunity to come back and uh, uh, get back practicing in my community. So uh, I'm here to talk about uh, both chronic and acute uh, causes of shoulder pain. A lot of the talk will be uh, some of the chronic, uh, long-term, long-lasting causes of shoulder pain uh, that limit daily activities and uh, can cause quite a bit of um, problems with uh, things many of us in Central Oregon enjoy, uh, doing outdoor recreational activities, being in the mountains, playing sports, uh, being with our family and friends. So some of these are quite debilitating. Um, people ask me, you know, what's, what are some of the most common or most severe causes of pain in, in orthopedics and, and the shoulders is absolutely one of them. It causes difficulty with sleep, causes difficulty with, with our sports and uh, doing any simple activities like reaching for a cup of coffee or um, turning over while sleeping at night. So uh, definitely a large part of my practice and uh, definitely a lot of, of different conditions that can then can cause this pain. Um, so we'll go through uh, some of the common symptoms, uh, both uh, pain, uh, weakness, dysfunction of the shoulder, difficulty with overhead activities, and uh, how it compromises the shoulder. I want to go through some basic anatomy just to get everybody on the same page. Um, simple anatomy that uh, will help with our discussion. Um, very interesting to me there. Uh, the, the shoulder is a, a very fascinating joint. It's a, a very unstable joint, unlike uh, the hip or the knee. Uh, it's basically, uh, we always liken it to a golf ball on a golf tee. Uh, so a ball and socket joint um, is, is really not a deep socket. It's mostly held in place by uh, the muscles and ligaments around the shoulder. So it's mostly constrained by the soft tissue. Uh, so looking here at the normal shoulder anatomy, specifically the rotator cuff, uh, you can see the top supraspinatus muscle. That is the main rotator cuff tendon uh, that causes the majority of uh, rotator cuff symptoms. Uh, and it's the one we treat most often surgically. Uh, the front rotator cuff muscle is the subscapularis. And then in the back, there's the infraspinatus and, and uh, teres minor. And those, those four tendons make up the rotator cuff and lead to stability in the shoulder, allow us to lift our arm away from the body and uh, hold up objects uh, working around the house, uh, simple things like making a cup of coffee, uh, holding a drill, um, playing golf, all, all sorts of activities that allow us to bring our arm away from our body uh, is required. Uh, we are required to have rotator cuff function. So um, looking a little deeper into the shoulder, here's the bony anatomy. Uh, a lot of us know that it's a ball and socket joint. So we have the humerus, uh, which is the arm bone and the humeral head, which articulates with the glenoid or the socket. So that's the basic ball and socket joint. And the socket is part of our shoulder blade. And uh, the third bone uh, that connects is kind of more of a strut. So it's the collarbone, the, the clavicle, uh, which helps hold our shoulder out to length. It's not really a weight bearing bone. So uh, when people have injuries, breaking their clavicle, breaking their collarbone, uh, very commonly with mountain biking or, or biking activities, uh, that is, it's uh, not as substantial as, as breaking a leg, but uh, it can be quite painful and quite symptomatic. So we treat those often too. Um, but most of my talk is going to be going through a lot of the soft tissue uh, problems, uh, particularly labral injuries, uh, rotator cuff injuries, and problems with arthritis. So um, looking at uh, rotator cuff disease, and we'll be looking at uh, labral injuries, which can be very commonly incurred uh, from shoulder dislocations. 
and uh, we'll look at arthritis, which is basically the loss of cartilage in the joint and the body's reaction to that. And then uh, we'll talk about how do we manage this pain? So um, some of the uh, non-surgical early treatments that uh, we recommend, and, and it's, it's very important to trial conservative treatments. Uh, it's, it's the best way to get uh, simple, um, sometimes long lasting relief uh, with, with minimal intervention. Uh, so we usually start with lifestyle changes, so changing activities. Um, a lot of times this can be through help with physical therapy. Uh, something as simple as changing uh, the way our shoulder blade moves against our, our chest wall and, and moving our shoulder and holding it in a position can change uh, the amount of pain that, that people experience related to arthritis or rotator cuff problems or, or labral problems. Um, we also like to trial medications. Uh, a lot of a lot of my patients don't like taking a lot of medications. I don't like taking medications personally as well, but sometimes uh, simple non-steroidals can be safe and effective for short-term use. Uh, Tylenol can be as well, acetaminophen, and that can decrease inflammation and provide uh, significant relief that allows uh, patients to get back to uh, golfing and other, other activities that they enjoy. So you hear a lot about cortisone injections and in, in my practice, they are a, a, an important tool uh, to get patients back to a good level of function and out of pain. Uh, they're very, it's a very strong anti-inflammatory and it's usually injected either in the shoulder joint itself or above the rotator cuff in the subacromial space. And I can go back a few slides to show. Um, so usually, uh, it, we inject it right above the rotator cuff. Uh, you can see just above the supraspinatus and this can decrease inflammation in a bursal area here where there can be shoulder impingement. That's basically where the soft tissue of the rotator cuff and bursa can get pinched between the acromion here over on the left side of your screen. And uh, it can be in, inflamed for long periods of time. A lot of times it's, it's wear and tear of the rotator cuff. It's just from long-term use and the collagen fibers are, are breaking down and our body's trying to heal it, but it's just not doing a good job. And so I liken it to that soft tissue is getting swollen, inflamed, trying to heal. And it's kind of like biting the inside of your cheek. It just stays swollen and keeps getting impinged. And uh, we just need uh, something to help calm that down. So a, a cortisone shot is a great way to do that. Uh, a lot of people ask me how long they last. Anywhere from two to six months is kind of the general range. The average is about three to four months. It's not a very good tool if it's lasting less than three to four months. Uh, what we do know is that cortisone and steroid injections do break down collagen and collagen is the building blocks of our soft tissue. And so it's not a, it's not a good tool to use repetitively and very frequently because it does actually stunt our body's healing response. So a one time, a two time, uh, potentially three time injection uh, over the course of, of years uh, is, is safe and effective, uh, but not, not more frequent than that. Um, also talk about hyaluronic acid injections. Uh, this is something we use in the knee uh, for treatment of arthritis, uh, mild arthritis symptoms. And it, it does get used. It's not often approved for treatment of, of shoulder uh, degeneration or wear and tear, uh, but it can be effective. So it's something you need, you need to speak with your doctor about uh, trialing. Uh, but it's nice because it can be effective and it can uh, be a, a tool outside of using cortisone injections and surgery. And then uh, PRP, uh, it's becoming more and more common in, in practice. Uh, uh, you hear it in a lot of uh, outside clinics that uh, people are trying stem cells and platelet-rich plasma is what PRP is. And the idea is that it incites a healing response. Um, I, it does get touted as stem cells to regrow the joint. And, and this hasn't been borne out in the literature yet. Uh, it does give some symptomatic relief, uh, although it has been temporary. Um, most often it uh, does in uh, treatment of, of chronic tendonitis, tendonitis, so inflammation of tendons, uh, but restoring a joint that's uh, very arthritic or has no cartilage, it, it hasn't been shown to, to give any substantial benefit or long lasting benefit. So uh, it, it, if it is to be used, uh, the, the difficulty is insurance often doesn't cover it. So it, it tends to be an out of pocket cost for patients, which is, which is difficult. And uh, the uh, relief it provides can, can often be temporary. 
Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the more long-term uh, definitive solutions, uh, which which I think is important. Uh, it's it's good to kind of um, uh, basically uh, get to understand what the what the surgical treatment are, options are, what the recovery period looks like, and how beneficial they can be. Because um, there's there's a lot of, of of talk about these treatments, a lot of misconceptions, and so it's good to kind of go uh, and go through each one and, and understand what they can and can't do. Um, so I'm going to go through rotator cuff repair, so repair of, of the main tendons of the shoulder, um, arthroscopic debridement, so use it, arthroscopic meaning camera surgery of the shoulder, and then uh, that's basically uh, a debridement is a, a cleanup, is a, is a surgical term for a cleanup of the shoulder. Then arthroscopic labral repair, looking at uh, basically uh, repairing that cartilage ring that goes around the socket, which can get torn to shoulder dislocations, and then uh, looking at the, the shoulder replacement options. There's, there's two main types. There's an anatomic, which is just replacing the ball and socket, uh, uh, as uh, just like a knee replacement with, with metal and plastic in, in its normal uh, position. And then lastly is the reverse total shoulder, which is uh, uh, changing the orientation, uh, switching the orientation from a ball and socket to a socket and a ball. And I'll go through that. And that, that's a very, very common shoulder replacement these days for folks with arthritis and rotator cuff dysfunction. So um, looking briefly at instability of the shoulder, uh, it can be a, a common problem with uh, younger individuals playing sports. What happens is uh, most commonly, 90, 95% of the time, the shoulder will come out anteriorly, so coming out the front of the socket. And what this can do is it can tear uh, the front of the, of the labrum and the ligaments in the front of the shoulder. And you can see here, this is looking at the socket as if we're looking in at the shoulder. And what it can do is it can tear the labrum and it can break off a piece of bone and create long lasting instability. Um, so uh, why this is important is it's important to understand that if patients have had injuries in the past, uh, especially playing sports, playing football, soccer, where their shoulders popped out, it can lead to cartilage injuries. It can uh, increase the rate of degeneration. And it's important to know uh, that it is important to fix these. So we see it most commonly in uh, younger athletes, ages 10 to 20, um, is the play, patients playing high school sports is the most common place we see it. Uh, most shoulder dislocations come out the front and the recurrence rate is very high. So it can lead to chronic instability because what happens is that labrum pulls off the bone, the, that cartilage ring pulls off the bone and it can lead to um, increased space in the joint and more mobility of the ball in the socket joint because it is it's really just that golf ball on a golf tee and it really doesn't have a whole lot of soft soft tissue holding in place so once that gets torn basically opens up a pocket for that shoulder to move within so i like to include this picture it shows what it takes to get the shoulder back in i've, I've done it up in the mountains when people uh, fall in skiing and uh, shoulder pops out and it's a relatively simple procedure that requires uh, some sedation sometimes not and basically just traction and counter traction and that just helps get that ball back in the socket joint relaxes the muscles oh keep pulls the ball away from the socket so they can go back into place uh, so simple procedure can uh, even outside of the hospital um, can help patients uh, basically relocate their joint, uh, give them pain relief and uh, in, improve their stability long-term with a, with a simple reduction. Um, so I do like to talk about um, slap tears. They're a very common problem. A lot of us have it when we've been playing overhead sports in, in high school and college, uh, especially uh, tennis, throwing athletes and playing softball and baseball. And what happens is the long head, so the, the small tendon of our biceps, uh, we have two uh, tendons in our biceps and it attaches to the top of the labrum here, uh, the, the small one, the, the large one attaches on the shoulder blade. And this creates chronic traction on the labrum and with repetitive activities or, or basically a traction on the arm, a pulling of the arm can uh, tear part of the labrum where the biceps tendon originates. And what happens is it creates a lot of difficulty with returning to tennis, overhead serving or overhead pitching. And a lot of times it can just create 
impingement and inflammation around the biceps tendon. So this is actually one of the most common injuries I do see um, that does turn into a chronic problem, pain in the front of the shoulder. So it's always something to look at. And when you go into the doctor, um, it's important that they examine your biceps tendon because it is one of the main causes of shoulder pain. So long head of the biceps uh, coming out uh, from the top of the socket over the front of the shoulder, right next to the, the rotator cuff. Uh, so uh, these are the most common areas I see. Uh, pain, and uh, it's important to look not only at the rotator cuff, but at the long head of the biceps. Um, so uh, looking at with shoulder uh, dislocation, uh, important to uh, recognize it on MRI. And th this will be a common theme uh, looking at uh, many of these shoulder problems is that MRI is very, very uh, helpful tool. And it's, it, it's not the first line of, of treatment with shoulder pain, but um, once we've gone through the course of conservative treatment, it's, it's important to then uh, look further and look deeper. Um, X-rays provide a lot, of, uh, a lot of good evidence of what's going on. A simple dislocation can be diagnosed on X-ray. You can see here up to the upper right, but then to get a better look at soft tissue, uh, an MRI is very important. It shows us the rotator cuff tendons, which we can't see on x-ray. It shows us the labral tissue. It shows us cartilage. So all of those important soft tissue structures, we need an MRI to look at. Um, so I just like to show some basic pictures of what it looks like to do a labral repair. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting surgery and uh, very helpful. Uh, the success rate is very high in the 90, 95% range. And what we do is basically tack the labrum down to the bone uh, with these anchors you can see over here on the left side of your screen. And basically we lasso that labrum and get it back to the socket where you can see that interface where the arrows are. To the right is the cartilage of the socket. And, uh, and then over far left, you can see the humeral head with normal cartilage on it. And, and then those stitches, those polyester stitches, pull that labrum and soft tissue back to the bone, basically shrinking that pocket in the front of the shoulder where the shoulder dislocates it. And it kind of shrink wraps the shoulder. And so we do that arthroscopically. You can see it with a camera here, placing anchors through little poke holes in the front of the shoulder. And it's very successful and recovery is, is uh, uh, nearly full by five months and, and patients can get back to sports. So I'm gonna move on to the rotator cuff problems. Um, that's, I know I'm running through a lot. I just wanna look and see if uh, we have any questions. Um, so cortisone injections, um, a question is whether it builds up throughout the body. My, my look is at cortisone injections uh, specifically to one joint. Uh, very little is systemically absorbed when you have a cortisone injection. And uh, I have a lot of patients say, oh, I just had cortisone injections in my back. Can I have one in my shoulder? And, and the, the, uh, simple answer, depending on how many of the patients had, is, is yes, it's safe. That uh, when it's actually directed at one single joint, uh, that the uh, effect is local and the the potential detriment to a long term uh, utilization of the cortisone is is minimized. So. Uh, it, whether somebody's had an injection in their knee, in their back, uh, an injection in their shoulder is, is usually safe. I'm more worried when somebody's already had five injections in their shoulder from different providers. And then uh, number one, it's probably not that effective at that point. And number two, it can't it can be detrimental to the, to the joint itself. Um, and a question about, um, does an MRI show how bad it, or what's really going on? Um, it's it's a very uh, deep and detailed look at the anatomy of the shoulder. So it shows me uh, just what the makeup of the shoulder is. It, it can show where inflammation is, but what uh, patients do need to understand is an MRI is basically cuts with a magnet that basically looks at water and the soft tissues. And it's not x-rays, it's not radiation, which is nice, but it is still, it's a five millimeter cut. So it does skip over little portions of the shoulder. So it doesn't give a 100% accurate look always. Um, it also doesn't show um, dysfunction related to actual functional movement. So if there's a, a problem with, with actual stiffness or shoulder, plate, shoulder blade mechanics, biomechanics being off, the MRI can't show that. And those can be a lot of causes of a lot of pain. And a lot of patients have normal MRIs despite being stiff or having difficulty with the shoulder blade motion. So those are other things to look at. Okay, uh, so moving on to rotator cuff pathology and problems. Uh, it's 
been uh, documented that four and a half million physician visits uh, every year are related to a rotator cuff problem. Um, there's been quotes of 70% of patients over the age of 70 will have a rotator cuff tear. Uh, I liken it to, uh, it, it's a wear and tear type condition. It's, it's just something we use through life. And, and the analogy I, I like to use is, is like a fan belt in a car. We've used it enough and eventually it frays and eventually can tear. And sometimes it's symptomatic and sometimes it's not. Some people can go through life having a rotator cuff tear and hardly notice it because their daily activities and uh, the nature of the tear just don't create symptoms. They adapt to it, so to speak. Um, so what we look at, what we really only see in clinic are the symptomatic ones, the ones that cause pain. Uh, so a rotator cuff tear is basically a detachment of that. It's, it's generally the supraspinatus. So it's generally that top tendon that lies right under the deltoid muscle. And what happens is it basically uh, brings that muscle offline. It can't do the work of, of raising the shoulder and raising the arm away from the body. And uh, a lot of overhead workers always have this event patients who do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, and then in more acute settings, patients that have had a shoulder dislocation where the ball pop, pops out of the socket and it can actually put traction on the tendon and tear it. Um, so uh, a lot of the common symptoms are pain at night, pain with overhead lifting and weakness of, of holding the arm away from the side. Uh, for diagnosis, number one, it's important to get a good physical exam, strength test in the office, get a history. That'll tell us a lot of these uh, common uh, symptoms like nighttime pain and difficulty with lifting. It's important to get an x-ray. It does help rule out arthritis. And the reason why is an x-ray can show if there's joint space narrowing between the ball and the socket. And you normally there'll be space between the two bones. And that's because cartilage separates it, which is clear on x-ray. If there's no separation between the two bones, which I'll show a little later in the, the talk, it shows that there's no cartilage separating those two bones. Um, like I said, uh, an MRI is the gold standard. It gives us a ton of information. It helps us understand whether the tendon is detached, whether there's cartilage problems and, or any loose bodies in the shoulder and can give us a sense of uh, what we can do to repair it. So this is an MRI uh, of a shoulder. It's a T2 weighted uh, that shows fluid basically. And what you can see here in the center of the screen, I'll try and show with my arrow. Basically you have the ball and socket joint here and uh, the muscle of the rotator cuff is right here. And normally a tendon is this nice jet black structure here and it should be attached all the way over here. So we can see that there's a gap between the tendon and that's what, that's what a tear will look like. So that's what we're looking for on MRI. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that I know doctors have to look at for a long time to, to understand, uh, but just to give a, a general idea of what we're, what we're looking at on MRI. So the, the difficulty with rotator cuff tears is they do not heal. It limits strength, it can cause persistent pain. And then we have to decide which ones are important to repair. Uh, pain despite treatment, so cortisone injections, anti-inflammatory treatment, activity modification, and physical therapy uh, are all mainstays of treatment for uh, initial presentation. So in, uh, initially a patient coming in uh, that has uh, evidence of a rotator cuff tear. If none of that works, then we move on to get the diagnosis with an MRI and and decide whether uh, surgical treatment is warranted. And so I, I usually look at an MRI as uh, a tool to plan surgery. It's a roadmap for surgery. So it's not something that we just uh, will order because they, they are um, relatively costly tests and we, we need to know, okay, are we gonna do something with this new information? When patients aren't, in, aren't interested in surgery and they get good relief from cortisone injections and MRI isn't ne necessarily uh, an important, an important first step. So um, then once we start looking at more um, of a long-term problem, something that patients do want to get a, a more definitive solution, then an MRI is helpful. And we can look at whether there is uh, basically significant retraction of the tear. Uh, like on the MRI I showed you, it showed that the tendon was far, far away from where it attaches on the humerus. You can see kind of where this blue line is and where the rotator cuff would normally attach and the gap uh, in between. So you wouldn't normally in a normal shoulder would not be able to see the cartilage of the humerus right there. Uh, so that is, that is the hole in the tendon that we fix. Uh, so um, in surgery, uh, most often we're, we're doing these arthroscopic. Uh, some, some surgeons like to do these surgeries with a mini open incision, uh, which is very effective as well. But uh, most commonly today, this is an arthroscopic procedure. 
and I'll show a little video later, but it, what we do is we place anchors in the bone of the humerus and lasso that tendon back down to the bone. What that does is it allows the, the connection to be restored between the tendon and the bone. And then what we rely on, why the, the recovery can be uh, so long is it takes five, six months for that tendon to reattach to the bone. Our body has to heal back in. If, if we just rely on those anchors in that repair, moving the shoulder around will separate the tendon from the bone and we'll be back to square one. So that's why we, we do the long uh, four weeks of sling wear, um, which uh, then transitions to no, no lifting, but we're starting a range of motion for the next four to six weeks. And then about three months before we can uh, have patients start lifting. So it can feel like a long time, uh, but what I say is it's an investment in the, in the future. It's alternatively, we know rotator cuff tendons do not heal. And so the pain and symptoms usually do continue uh, without this treatment. So this is the best option of restoring our shoulder function and getting that rotator cuff uh, back online uh, to have uh, more normal uh, shoulder mechanics and uh, decreased pain. Uh, so this is what a, what a look of, like through an arthroscope, through one of our cameras in surgery. We're looking above the rotator cuff and you can see these large this large gap between the tendon and the bone. And what we do is we pass sutures through this tendon. So polyester uh, sutures, non-dissolvable sutures, which uh, we have a little instrument that I'll show in the video that you can pass the, the suture through the tendon and then basically bring it back down to the bone. And we usually do a mattress uh, type um, crossing stitches that help hold that tendon down the bone. And that gives time for that tendon to heal to the bone. And ultimately once the tendons heal to the bone, the repair is, is not necessarily, we don't go take it out or anything, but um, it doesn't uh, serve a purpose uh, ultimately. And that, that is the goal. We want the tendon to be, uh, to restore its connection back to the humerus. Um, so this surgery as an arthroscopic procedure is generally an outpatient surgery. It takes uh, two to three hours in, in general uh, to complete. And a nerve block is usually used in along with general anesthesia. So patients are asleep. And what a nerve block means is we numb up the, the nerves going to the arm, which can uh, decrease significant amount of pain uh, by bringing the nerves offline, usually for about 24 hours uh, to help patients uh, feel more comfortable when waking up and uh, when they go home. Uh, Arthroscopic repair uses uh, usually in the neighborhood of five to six uh, small incisions to uh, which are poke holes around the shoulder. And we can place the anchors uh, th through those incisions along with uh, use our instruments and the arthroscope uh, to look around the shoulder. The success rate of this surgery is very high. Uh, it's 85, 95% patient satisfaction. And I do like to mention that uh, uh, as a side note, uh, that long head of the biceps runs usually right with that rotator cuff and can be uh, very symptomatic uh, because of chronic inflammation, chronic wear and tear uh, from that biceps tendon that runs over the front of the shoulder. So uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll clip the biceps tendon in the shoulder where it comes off that top of the labrum and reattach it lower on the arm. So it's not getting inflamed by the repair or uh, impingement in the shoulder. And it solves uh, two problems at the, at the same setting. Um, so just want to show this little video. This gives uh, folks an idea of what the surgery likes, it looks like. And uh, basically what we do is we place two anchors in the bone. You can see here, uh, uh, sometimes three, right, right at the uh, articular surface, so right where the cartilage starts. And with those sutures, uh, we pass them uh, with a needle through the tendon and lasso that tendon. You can see they're grasped outside the, the shoulder through usually cannulas such as these, so these little um, passport cannulas. And we grasp them, uh, place a couple more punch holes, uh, which are usually five millimeters, pretty small, and can place a screw to hold those sutures down. What it does is it pulls the tendon over and secures it. And so we repeat that several times and can pass uh, simple sutures to pull the tendon down. There's a lot of configurations we use because there's many different types of tears and this can help secure the tendon down to the bone. Um, the strength is, is fantastic and it holds the tendon in place uh, because we do, we want a, a very robust repair because patients are gonna get back to moving and ranging the shoulder and start uh, lifting things before the tendon is fully healed. So that's important. 
So generally post-op protocols, four to six weeks, uh, full-time sling wear, then beginning gentle range of motion with strengthening commencing at about three months. So, you know, it's about a quarter of the year and then full recovery, see it about six to eight months. Uh, so it, the dedication of time is about six to eight months. Most folks don't need physical therapy that whole time. But usually after the three to four month mark, uh, patients are, are working on home range of motion exercises and they're, uh, they're working on strengthening the shoulder at that point. Uh, so then I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the, what we do after rotator cuff surgery or if there's uh, significant degeneration in the shoulder. And that, that leads to shoulder replacement. And there's usually generally two main indications. Um, there's rotator cuff problems, which are irreparable rotator cuff tears. So if we are not able to lasso that tendon and repair it over, uh, then a shoulder replacement does become an option. And then the, the second option is uh, the second surgery is, is for arthritis. So wear and tear of that cartilage. Uh, so shoulder generation, you can see when, when I was mentioning uh, that loss of joint space over on that left x-ray, you can see where the humerus uh, is touching the socket there. Normally there'd be a bit of joint space, kind of what you see up, up above here, but uh, there's none down below in the socket. Uh, so what that leads to is your body, your body um, tries to, to heal that joint. It knows it's damaged, it knows it's having more friction, um, more irritation, and that leads to a lot of swelling and inflammation of the capsule, which causes pain and stiffness and what we call uh, arthritis. And arthritis looks like this if we look from uh, arthroscope, so through a camera, and you can see this pink bone on both the socket and the ball, and you can see kind of frayed cartilage in the center here. And that's, that's when an arthritic joint looks like. We don't usually uh, go in with a camera. It has been um, considered in some cases when patients are really trying to avoid uh, a shoulder replacement to clean up that damaged tissue, uh, loosen up the shoulder joint, and give some relief uh, for uh, in the order of, of a year or two. Uh, but it is not a long-term solution because what, what the problem is is our body cannot regrow cartilage. It doesn't have good blood flow. Uh, we can't just uh, we can't inject cartilage. We can't uh, inject stem cells that regrow cartilage, uh, which is which is the why it is a difficult problem and why our best option is shoulder replacement. There there are ob obviously a lot of uh, uh, folks out there who are trying to show that they can restore joints with without surgery, um, but there's no real consistent evidence that that anybody can do this. So. Um, what we're, what we're looking at is what's the best way to give patients long lasting relief, uh, that will actually uh, give them their function back. And the best salute tool we have right now, when, when a joint is like this with bone on bone is with a shoulder replacement. Um, so there's uh, several different types of, of joint replacements for the shoulder. Um, I mentioned that anatomic, so a, a ball and socket replacing the ball and socket. And we can use uh, a lot of a bone sparing implant, which is very nice these days. Um, they're, they're not as long as stems that go down the, the humerus. So it, it maintains as much of our, our normal anatomy as possible. And uh, a small uh, socket is generally a polymer. Um, that we can secure with both cement and bone and the body actually grows into it on the socket side. So it's a, a metal on the ball and a polymer on the socket and that's the new bearing surface rather than the bone on bone which is causing the arthritic symptoms. And then the alternative is flipping that around. So instead of a, a ball on this side and a socket on this side, uh, it's the reverse shoulder and this is what we use uh, when a patient doesn't have a rotator cuff and evidence of arthritis or significant wear and tear because they don't have a rotator cuff. And so when we're unable to repair the rotator cuff and they're having significant symptoms, which are usually difficulty lifting the arm away from the side, significant weakness, inability to raise uh, their arm overhead, then we're, we're looking at a, an option like this. And this has grown in popularity over the last 15, 20 years uh, because it's a fantastic solution. It gives patients uh, sometimes immediate relief, uh, great overhead function and uh, res restoration of uh, their shoulder motion, which they otherwise wouldn't have. And it, it lasts long a long time. Uh, we don't know exactly how long. The, the concern was that this polymer was wearing out fast and leading to de degeneration over course of decades, but uh, now that the polymers are more durable, uh, we're, th we're thinking on average that these are lasting 20, 30, 30 years easily. So um, it's not something that necessarily needs to be uh, revised every 10 years uh, as, as was thought previously. 
Uh, so this is a look at the two options. So primary shoulder replacement with the ball and sockets, joint in their standard configuration versus the reverse, which we're using for uh, patients with rotator cuff dysfunction. And uh, this is just another look at uh, when we're using it. So usually uh, when that supraspinatus tendon is far retracted, so back over onto the shoulder blade and there's significant atrophy. So what happens is when that, that rotator cuff is torn for a long period of time, it, the muscle isn't doing any work, so it atrophies. And that is irreversible, we know. So even if we were miraculously able to pull that tendon over and get it to heal, the muscle wouldn't be able to do any work anyway because it's, it's lost so much strength. So that's when a reverse shoulder replacement is a much better option. It gets patients their, their overhead function back and uh, much more uh, use of their shoulders. So it's a great option for that. This is a look at the kind of the generations of, of shoulder replacements. We're definitely trying to get away from these stemmed implants uh, and to using more low profile implants. It's uh, uh, less invasive, for number one, and uh, preserves as much of a uh, patient's normal anatomy. Uh, so uh, there's less disruption to the soft tissues. So uh, these lower profile implants have uh, great uh, longevity. Uh, our bodies do grow into this metal, which is uh, very useful as it decreases the incidence of loosening. We don't have to use cement like we used to. And uh, sorry, jump in there. And uh, with uh, um, and, and the satisfaction is much higher. So um, things to consider for surgery, um, then we'll, we'll get to questions. I'm uh, we're looking at how long, how long does the surgery uh, take? Usually it's about an hour uh, to two hours. Uh, patients don't need to stay in the hospital. It's an outpatient surgery, just like a rotator cuff. And uh, we can utilize a nerve block and patients are in a sling for about four weeks and have no significant lifting for about three months. And that's because we do have to repair the front rotator cuff muscle, the subscapularis in the front. We'd like that to heal uh, after a shoulder replacement. So pretty similar recovery period like a rotator cuff. And then patients get into physical therapy to decrease the risk of stiffness and that joint capsule tightening up. So we gotta mobilize that. And uh, this will uh, help with uh, achieving a full recovery. Um, so the incision for a shoulder replacement, usually about four inches long over the front of the shoulder. Um, and that is, uh, usually done with, um, with it's closed with dissolvable sutures and it usually becomes, uh, quite cosmetic, uh, once it's fully healed. Um, what helps, uh, with recovery? Um, it's important for patients to, to get back to daily activities as, as, uh, easy, as soon as possible. It, it helps patients uh, stay mobile and uh, if they're able to maintain their sling and be able to, to walk and uh, get back to normal uh, lifestyle as soon as possible, it, it helps the overall recovery. So I like that patients aren't, aren't staying in a hospital. They're, they're home, they're able to eat their own food, they're able to be with their family and uh, it helps with the overall uh, morale after surgery because it, it is, um, a difficult time. Uh, pain is, is not insignificant and the first couple of weeks can be re relatively tough and so it's uh, it's good to feel as uh, as normal and active as possible. So as long as patients are able to maintain their sling and, and not lift with the arm, uh, I, I recommend uh, relatively normal activities as long as they're not strenuous. Um, so uh, the importance of physical therapy, um, absolutely important. Uh, there used to be the recommendation of no physical therapy for the reverse shoulder replacements. Um, I, I see that patients uh, almost always benefit from physical therapy after shoulder surgery. It's just a joint that gets uh, remarkably stiff when it's uh, immobilized for a long period. So it's good to start gentle range of motion exercises and then work on strengthening thereafter. And um, with the shoulder replacement, it's, it's relatively similar to a rotator cuff, approximately five eight to eight months of recovery time. Um, there's the reverse shoulders. I see pretty good results at about four months uh, because we're not relying as much on the rotator cuff to, to restore strength and motion. Uh, so as long as the mechanics around the shoulder using the deltoid muscle uh, are, are restored, um, with, with physical therapy, patients get a good recovery around four months. But I always say that uh, even though patients are getting good overhead function at that time frame, they do see benefits through the whole year, through 12 months. Uh, so, you know, the important uh, points to focus on what we're trying to treat with these surgery, uh, surgeries is decrease 
uh, to greasing and elimination of their pain, restoring mobility, uh, improving sleep, and then returning to, to relatively normal daily activities. Um, with rotator cuff surgery, we're looking at patients once it's healed to re return to normal functions. Um, their outdoor recreational lifestyle, golfing, uh, tennis, racquetball, uh, pickleball, those sorts of things are all fine. Uh, same, same with shoulder replacement surgeries. Uh, there used to be a, a weight limit for reverses in, in anatomic shoulders. Uh, but this has uh, gone somewhat by the wayside. We're seeing that these are very durable implants, uh, mostly because of the way that those metal implants are and our bodies are growing into them. Um, that helps with uh, decreasing the risk of loosening and, and helping patients get back to uh, normal activities. Now, it doesn't mean that going back to significant overhead lifting or doing military presses or, or heavy squat, uh, heavy um, uh, like power cleans and overhead lifting, but uh, it still can lead to a very normal lifestyle after surgery. Um, with surgery, um, this is you know one of those things that uh, any surgery we do can lead to complications. So it's important to consider the risks, um, although they're very, very rare. Um, infection, something we prevent, we give patients antibiotics around the time of surgery. Uh, we uh, work very significantly on soft tissue maintenance, so it prevents dislocation. Um, fractures can happen, so broken bones can happen, and then the, the implants can loosen. So a lot of what we talk about in the techniques uh, placing shoulder replacements is uh, preventing these, these complications, which are, are exceedingly rare, which is important. Um, and then, you know, overall patient satisfaction with these surgeries is, is really high. It, it really can remove pain. Uh, the main issue that I, I talk about with my patients in clinic is that it's, it's really an investment in the future. You are dedicating six months to dealing with your shoulder. It will be something you think about many uh, nearly every day right after surgery and it does take work and we do get through that um, so um, looking at uh, considerations for deciding whether to proceed with surgery um, it's important that patients are, are in, in their best health before surgery so we usually have them get a preoperative visit um, and make sure that uh, there's no other other medical conditions that may need to, need to be addressed before surgery. Um, insurance generally covers these procedures. And like I mentioned, uh, when we're talking rotator cuff shoulder replacement surgery, uh, outcomes are, are very, very good. Um, you know, it doesn't restore the shoulder to a, a shoulder when we're, you know, very, very young, 16 year old shoulder, but it can restore a, a significantly unhealthy shoulder to a, a very, very normal state of, uh, of activity. So a lot of these shoulder, shoulder surgeries are very good after the recovery period. Um, side effects and complications. Uh, the most common one that I see is stiffness. Uh, like I said, the shoulder joint is just a uh, very, a, a relatively unstable joint and uh, surrounded by uh, significant soft tissue structures and when scar tissue forms like it does after any surgery because there's there's bleeding and there's a loss of motion during the time we're, we're staying in this sling for a long period of time that shoulder tightens up and so that's what we work very hard with physical therapy to achieve is getting that motion back so that's one of the main complications and side effects we see so um Pain is, is, it varies. Uh, rotator cuff surgery can be, I, I say it's uncomfortable. It's, it's mostly at night and it, it is because of the stiffness and difficulty with rolling over at night and, and mobilization. But this, this improves certainly over the first six weeks, gets better by three months. And it's just, a, it's a gradual improvement over that whole time period. So when, when folks ask me how long they need to be off from these surgeries, it varies at the type of job. When, when folks are working at, at the office, they can return relatively quickly, I'd say in two to three weeks. Uh, more heavy labor uh, positions, patients need in the, in the order of months to, to get back to those just until we can start strengthening and getting the shoulder back into a, a mobile position so they're able to do their job. And uh, long-term restrictions, ideally after these surgeries, there's, there's none. So uh, that, that's my general practice. Other surgeons have different practices, but I, I like to get patients back to what they like to do. Um, understanding that, you know, the risks of some of these surgeries is it, it, it can return. Rotator cuffs can retear, um, shoulder replacements can loosen. So it's just, uh, that's just something after surgery to be careful about and, uh, and treat the shoulder appropriately, not getting to high, high impact activities and, and treating our shoulder well. Uh, so that, that's a conversation we have before any surgery. And then when can folks return to exercise? Um, 
quite quickly when we're looking at uh, being able to walk around the neighborhood or, or get on an exercise bike or elliptical. Um, that can be in the matter of weeks. Uh, when we're talking about getting into lifting, it's kind of in that order of three to four months range. Um, so looking at success factors, uh, it's, it's really important to, to maintain overall uh, level of fitness and, and health and make sure that we're working with primary care physicians uh, to get our patients in, in the best physical condition before surgery and uh, then a com commitment to rehabilitation after surgery. Um, so I'm going to go to questions now. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to this talk and I, I hope this uh, answered a lot of questions about shoulder pain, but uh, let me see if we can um, answer some of the questions that are out there. Um, so, um, looking at, uh, so looking at labor repairs, a four to five month recovery time for labor, uh, repairs, uh, often this is the case, uh, five months is generally when we're looking at, uh, getting patients to be able to start sport specific training. Um, it doesn't mean that, uh, that shoulders are hundred percent by five months, but this is usually when we can take off a lot of the restrictions. We know that there's significant healing between the soft tissue and the bone. And, uh, that is, uh, the time frame we're looking at. Um, let me see here. So looking at uh, cortisone shots uh, for treatment for arthritis, um, uh, for the AC joints. So um, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the AC joint. I, I can't say it's a common pathology. What, what the AC joint is, is where that collarbone meets the shoulder blade, the acromioclavicular joint, and people can get arthritis there as well. So wear and tear of the cartilage. Um, and it can, be, it can be painful. We usually try a cortisone shot to number one, diagnose the, the AC joint um, pain and, and whether this is the source of uh, shoulder pain. And then if that is helpful, but is not long lasting, uh, we can do what's called a simple procedure, which is just a little distal clavicle excision. And we just take a piece of bone from that collarbone and widen the joint. And uh, what that does is give more space for the collarbone to move with the shoulder blade as we move our arm. And this can give significant relief. Uh, the surgery is an outpatient surgery. It's a, a relatively quick recovery, um, sling wear for several weeks, and then working on range of motion. So hopefully uh, near full uh, recovery by three months or so. And then a the question is, uh, uh, how strong is the tendon after surgery and reattachment can, can, compared to the original rotator cuff? And that's a, that's a great question. Um, we don't always know, and it, and it varies. It depends on the nature of the tendon when we when we are able to get in and repair it. Um, some tendons that are torn acutely, like in a sudden ep episode, like a fall from a bike where there's a shoulder dislocation, it separates the tendon from the bone. Uh, usually the tendon's generally healthy. We get a repair and we can get folks back to full recovery and the risk of re-tears is, is very, very low. Now, what we do know about the risk of re-tear is, um, it depends on how much retraction there is of the tendon, uh, what the nature of the tendon is and what the nature of the muscle is uh, behind the tendon. So if there's a lot of atrophy, um, a lot of degradation of the tendon, say it's been torn for a long period of time and it's, it's shrunk and the tissue hasn't uh, maintained its integrity, then the risk of re-tear is much higher. So a lot of times it depends mostly on the uh, nature of the injury, how long the tear has been there, and uh, just the, a lot of times the overall health of the patient, whether they have osteoporosis, um, loss of car, uh, calcium in their bone, uh, whether the tendon has uh, degraded over time. So those are things we can look at. We don't, we, we don't know exactly based on the MRI. A lot of this is uh, something that we don't realize until we, we get into surgery. There's no good way of assessing the tendon without looking at it and testing it at the time of surgery. So. I do have that conversation with patients who have large retra retracted rotator cuff tears that some of it will just depend on whether we're able to mobilize that tendon and get it to move over back to the bone and whether we can get it to, to secure to the bone adequately. And uh, sometimes in those large tears, it's, it's, we, do, we have to just get in there and, and start the repair to, to know whether uh, it's gonna work or not. Um, 
And then a question is, can physical therapy help alleviate pain and allow more movement? Uh, another very good question. Um, yes, it's, it can. Uh, it's not 100% of the time. Uh, a lot of times what it can help is it can help patients uh, change the way they move their shoulder blade, uh, recruit other muscles to the shoulder, which can offload uh, the, the patient's rotator cuff where there might be an injury and, and shift function to other muscle groups and alleviate pain that way. Um, it's not always 100%, but it can be significant, get patients back to the activities they enjoy without using surgery. So that's, that's the real important uh, part of, of physical therapy in, in the conservative treatment model. Um, and then another question, what is the time for full recovery for a total shoulder replacement, including reverse? Uh, so it, it varies. It's kind of on that uh, gradual uh, stepwise fashion of in increasing uh, activity. So four weeks in a sling and then to the three month mark, uh, we're, we're getting range of motion with physical therapy, not doing any significant heavy lifting, uh, but that strength builds up in between the three to six month mark. Now reverses tend to be uh, sometimes a little bit faster than uh, anatomics. And a lot of that is just because of recruiting and restoring the rotator cuff. Uh, anatomics, so the, the standard ball and socket shoulder replacement requires the rotator cuff to, to come back online. And reverses don't require that quite as much. And so uh, reverses can get reach their full function, which I should mention isn't uh, always full range of motion. It, it tends to be a little bit more stiff of a joint, but it does get patients overhead function and uh, returning to that uh, sometimes a little bit faster. So um, that returns between four to six months. And then after about six months, uh, the, the uh, curve kind of plateaus. P people are back to more normal activities, but they're building strength more slowly uh, to return more to their normal activity. So I see improvements up to a year, but uh, people are getting back to normal daily life activities four to six months range. That's, that's the answer. And then a question about uh, surgery for arthritis. Is a complete shoulder replacement um, the protocol or just uh, scraping the arthritis on the bone done first? And that kind of goes back to when I, I briefly mentioned an arthroscopic debridement. So an arthroscopic going with a camera and cleaning out uh, arthritis. One, one thing to know about arthritis is it isn't like a buildup of plaque. It's, it's the loss of cartilage. And then it's your body's reaction and inflammation of that injured joint because there isn't any cartilage. There's increased friction increased wear and tear on the bone and soft tissues in the joint and your body's reacting to that. So in general, arthroscopic treatment, which we've certainly learned in the knee, going in and cleaning out damaged cartilage uh, isn't been shown, has not been shown to be helpful. And it will lead to uh, benefit uh, oftentimes, uh, but not much more than uh, placebo. So the benefits can be in the order of months, maybe a year or two, certainly not uh, necessarily worth in incurring the risk of a surgery anesthesia and downtime and the risks of surgery. So we, we like to look at more long-term solutions. And that is where to actually fix the arthritis and remove the arthritis from the shoulder joint, it does take a shoulder replacement, either an anatomic shoulder or a reverse. And both of those options solve the problem of uh, arthritis in the shoulder. And then um, in a uh, question about impingement syndrome, which is uh, something we uh, briefly covered. And that is going back to the anatomy of that bursa, the loose connective tissue above the rotator cuff and between the top of the shoulder blade and the humerus bone, there's the rotator cuff and bursa. And that's inflammation in that space. And when we bring our arms up, it basically pinches that soft tissue, including the biceps tendon in the front, the rotator cuff and the in the bursa, and that can create uh, pain and inflammation and swelling in that area. And the problem with impingement is it lasts a long time. It doesn't just go away in a day or two. It's something that once the, the inflammation is there, it tends to stay. It's kind of like I mentioned with biting the inside of your cheek. Anytime we're using that shoulder joint, it just keeps irritating that tendon and, and bursa. So that's where physical therapy helps change our mechanics and can help offload uh, the way we are impinging the shoulder by changing our mechanics. 
uh, cortisone injections definitely can decrease the inflammation in that space. Uh, and that can be relatively long lasting in the order of months. I've definitely had patients where I've tried a cortisone injection, it knocks down that inflammation in that area. And uh, that solves the problem, kind of gets back to baseline. Uh, sometimes it can require a second injection. And for uh, more difficult cases, uh, we have to look at uh, potentially a surgical clean out. And that in the setting of an impingement where it's which, where it's bursitis, but there's no rotator cuff tear, there's no arthritis, a lot of times just cleaning out that bursa, potentially addressing the front of the, the shoulder with the biceps tendon is all it would take. And that's a relatively quick recovery, uh, not as much time in the sling. We're looking more in the order of uh, uh, eight to 12 weeks. And uh, a question about, in my experience, is it difficult to get insurance to agree to cover an MRI before one has had PT and the patient is, uh, uh, and, and pain is more long lasting? That's a good question. It varies, it varies by insurance um, somewhat, uh, but it's always good to trial conservative treatments. A lot of times this can be uh, doing a home exercise program and working on activity modifications, taking anti-inflammatories. And as long as patients have showed uh, some initial trial to treat the shoulder pain uh, without looking right to an MRI, uh, insurance companies uh, will often agree as, as long as uh, appropriate imaging has been taken. So it's important to, to get an x-ray, make sure there's nothing else going on, like a loose body in the shoulder, um, arthritis. So it's helpful to get a, a simple x-ray exam and then uh, then look at the, the treatment period. So um, it's, it's not good practice to just get an MRI after a week of shoulder pain. And, and most patients aren't looking for anything like that. Uh, but yeah, if there's been a, a valid attempt to treat the shoulder conservatively, watch, make see if it's going to have a chance to get better, uh, maybe some therapy, maybe some anti-inflammatories, then an MRI can often be warranted after that time period. And then, um, a question about uh, any suggestions to make sleeping more comfortable. Um, what kind of pillows or other aids? Um, that is difficult. Um, it's it's uh, people who aren't back sleepers who actually who like to lie on their side uh, oftentimes can have both shoulders that are causing them difficulty. Uh, there's there's different types of of uh, pillows, so being able to sit up a little bit, or beds that offer some lumbar support so patients can sit upright uh, can be helpful. Um, I have seen folks sleep in recliners. Obviously, that's not ideal, but that does help certainly after after surgery for a time period. Uh, but really, the, the best way to get uh, better sleep is to actually treat the underlying uh, cause. And so looking at trying to get the pain down and the inflammation down on the shoulder has really been the best option. Um, but any, any time that we're allowing some gravity to pull a little bit of, of tension on the shoulder tends to help. Um, anytime we're lying on the shoulder and it's compressing the shoulder joint and, and pushing up on potentially rotator cuff tears or impingement uh, between the shoulder blade and the humerus, that can, that can lead to more pain. So uh, uh, sitting more upright in bed has, has been the best uh, for patients who, who aren't undergoing surgery but having uh, persistent shoulder pain. Well, uh, I think we covered uh, a lot of the, of the questions and uh, I uh, hope this at least uh, gave some answers to folks about what may be causing the shoulder pain. And I do encourage you to, uh, if, to come in and, and see us at the center and uh, we can have a conversation about what might be causing symptoms and, and we can do a, a, a initial evaluation and, and I'll look deeper if, if these um, uh, problems may be affecting you and, and limiting function. Uh, what I do like to leave you with is, is it's, it's important to, to not put off shoulder pain if it's actually changing quality of life. And that, that's where I do think it's important. Uh, there are a lot of aches and pains in life, but once it starts limiting, you know, how we're interacting with our family, whether we're able to do the activities we enjoy, uh, there are a lot of good options to, to help solve these problems. So it's, it is worth uh, coming in and, and seeing us at the center and we can discuss how to make it better. Uh, but hopefully this gives an idea of what kind of the initial treatment options are and then uh, what some of the more um, definitive solutions are. And I thank you for uh, joining me this evening and I hope that was helpful. Take care.